really waiting for this uh, webinar with Zarina. Zarina uh, and uh, Sarika, um, you know, have very gratefully volunteered their time from the very busy schedules to come and speak to us. Um, so it's going to be a very interactive session. We are a smaller group. And um, I would request all of you to, you know, sort of, uh, you know, put in your questions. Um, you know, just ask whatever you all want to. Uh, I think we together as a collective group will be able to, you know, sort of uh, uh, go through this together. So um, let me uh, first tell you a little bit about Beyond Diversity. Okay, why is my screen not moving? Okay, so um, in Beyond Diversity, we actually believe in building a better world where differences are accepted and celebrated to enable equal opportunities. So the three main words here is accepting differences and celebrating. So, um, so we are glad uh, that we've been able to impact about 150 plus organizations and more than a lakh of individuals uh, in the last eight years that we have been working uh, in this space. Uh, what we do, uh, we actually uh, uh, do DNI consulting, we do social impact advisory, we do research, we do leadership development, we do mentoring and coaching. In fact, our mentoring program is, uh, you know, a world renowned and uh, we've actually been awarded as well um, for this program. And it's one of the only cross industry mentoring programs going on in the country. Um, we will, I will also be uh, we're talking about it uh, at the end of this program, a little bit more about it. Uh, and we also do a lot of advocacy uh, where we want to build positive linkages between business communities and people. So um, having said that, let me now first introduce uh, our first speaker, um, Zarina. Um, Zarina has been, uh, in fact, before I in fact give her a bio, she is actually, she sits on our Beyond Diversity board and has been a go-to mentor, um, support, you know, our go-to first person whenever we are, as Beyond Diversity, we are in, in, in some kind of a, a, a problem. So uh, thank you, Zarina, for being there. So apart from that, Zarina um, is from Hong Kong, but has spent most of her life uh, in the US. Um, you know, in the, in the women in tech field, she's been there. Uh, she was in IBM for 18 years. Uh, a Chinese woman of color in the US in one of the best organizations. I mean, she was the epitome of breaking the grass ceiling. Uh, she's held various positions in the field of sales and marketing. And uh, in the last few years, she actually moved uh, to Asia to experience this market as well. And she was the chief marketing officer for SAP in Singapore. And uh, two years back, she actually moved back to Austin um, uh, in the US and uh, is in a present role as the CMO of Cinity, where she uh, you know, overlooks all the aspects of marketing, marketing from strategy, brand, and communications. Um, as I said, she's a board member uh, for Beyond Diversity, and she's a mother of two sons, both working and studying in Boston. So thank you, Zarina, for being here. Really, really, really appreciate it uh, that you're always there for us. Thank you. Great to be here. Yeah. And our second um, uh, speaker today is Sarika. Sarika is also the co-founder of Beyond Diversity and um, born and raised in Kolkata from a Marwadi family, but breaking the glass ceiling, living across India and working across continents. That's what she is. Um, she is also an epitome of career resilience because from an investment banking a career to being an entrepreneur in making Beyond Diversity as uh, the foremost DNI consulting firm uh, and rated continuously over the last three years as the top 10 diversity consultants is, is, is a mark that uh, is not achievable so easily. She is currently putting her efforts in an education startup, uh, Plaksha University, and is leading the fundraising initiatives. Um, she has been a woman of influence. The Leadership in Mentoring Award uh, from Hillary Clinton uh, was given to her uh, in 2014. In fact, that is why we actually are known in the mentoring space as an organization where we are actually building future women leaders. She is currently as advisor uh, to Beyond Diversity, but uh, very much uh, our uh, sponsor and a mentor and support. Uh, she lives between Gurgaon and Hyderabad and is a mother to an assertive teenager. So thank you, Sarika, for being here. And... Uh, yeah, I know you've been very, very busy, uh, but thank you for taking out time and, you know, sort of being here. Thank you for Beyond Diversity. Yes. 
So, um, so I just wanted to tell the audience what we're going to do today. So um, by the end of the session, uh, of course, you all know the uh, you know, session, it's managing stakeholders. Uh, but what we want to do is we want to go in a little structured manner. So we want to give you an awareness of what might be your stakeholders. We will do a mapping of your stakeholders and we'll you know, sort of have a discussion whether they're delivering value or you are delivering value to them. We also will also be discussing a very interesting thing of managing stakeholders because um, it can get tricky because st stakeholders are of different kinds. And out of that, we'll also go a little more deeper on managing difficult stakeholders. And I, I do assume that you know all of us do have some good ones and not so good ones amongst us. So that's, that's what we're going to capture in the session. And it's going to be very interactive. Um, so Zarina has been very, very um, kind enough to put across a, uh, you know, a slide as well uh, for us to understand it better. So over to you, Zarina, and uh, let me know when I need to move the screen. And uh, over to both of you, looking forward. All right, well, thank you. Thank you very much. And first of all, uh, before I jump in, I wanted to really say that it's an honor to be a part of the whole Beyond Diversity uh, Foundation and the experience. My first experience actually was with Rashmi and Sarika uh, some years ago now, back when I was in India uh, on a visit. And I really want to applaud your effort and continue to applaud the efforts that you do for you know, the, the communities that you serve. And being a part of it is really a, a great honor to be. Um, and, and, and as we go through, just like Rashmi said, I'd love to have this being as much of an open dialogue as possible because we can all learn from each other and looking at specific cases and specific examples that you might like to share would bring this conversation even more to life. And uh, so if that's okay with you, Sarika, I'll go ahead and jump us, uh, get us jump started on the next page. Okay, so, um, so there we go. Um, so uh, when, when uh, Rashmi and team uh, reach out to myself and Sarika, I thought that the two of us would be the best of combination uh, because between us, and if I, I may mean, you chime in here, Zurika as well too, we bring all these points of views. And I, I would also say that we are two very opinionated women, uh, but hopefully from the standpoint of being able to serve our stakeholders and many of us combined here. Uh, so myself, I've been in the global and the local perspective. I've been, you know, we want to also look at this from a business and a personal perspective. Uh, Sarika, you bring the entrepreneurial and the nonprofit perspective as well. And all of us are at one time or another and sometimes on both roles in terms of being the shareholders as well as the contributors. So uh, Sarika, you want to chime in? Uh, oh, I, your... I could agree more, Zarina, on this. And I think um, with your global experience and with my local nuances to it, because there are cultural nuances to India as well while managing stakeholders, and of course, business and personal, we are managing. As women, we wear many hats all the time. So I think that will be interesting to see how we manage the different balls which are thrown in the air, whether it's family, whether it's career, whether it's you know uh, any other stakeholders, including our extended families of in-laws and mates. All these are mission mash of all kinds of stakeholders. So looking forward to this conversation. And, um, and one thing which Rashmi spoke about, the career resilience, I do believe that managing stakeholders in any kind of a careers remains the same. So I think the, the changes within the careers have been far easier if we understand managing stakeholders in all aspects and maintaining those relationships in all aspects. But yeah, couldn't agree more. Yeah, I, I love what you just said as well too, and probably we should have highlighted this, that there is a lot of cultural bearings, whether it's because of heritage or because of gender, because of just our overall upbringing. Uh, that, that's a big part of how we would look at things as well, too. So I would really invite the audience and those of you expect, you know, uh, male, female, you know, contributors or, or, or stakeholders or managers, not managers to kind of help us bring this to life because we've all played different roles. And uh, the one thing we highlighted on here on the last bullet is that I think the important part is, is, ma is balancing both, right? Balancing all of the above. Uh, at one time, and, and sometime I, I told my son, sometimes I feel like I'm schizophrenic because in this moment I got to be this, and that moment I got to be something else, and in all moments I have to be at least one, two, and three. And you know, it, it's, it's a little bit of a challenge just in our own days. Uh, and I think that especially right now, and as we talk about in the title, um, the pandemic has thrown another curve at us. 
And all of a sudden, you know, what used to be maybe a balanced view is kind of tilted, you know, one way or the other. So I love to have our dialogue to also bring in that, bring in bear in terms of COVID-19, what has it, what has it been doing for all of us? And uh, I'm sure that Sarika and I have our own respective, uh, uh, you know, examples. I'd love for the audience to help us with this as well. So uh, with that, let me just uh, go to the next page. And uh, as we were putting- I'll just yeah. add one thing, Jorina. Uh, so telling all the audience, if you have any questions in the middle, do put it in the chat mode so that in case if something is coming up with the things, we will try to address it as well. So make it as interactive as possible. Yeah, and I will be looking at the uh, screen and I will put across the uh, questions from the group to you. Perfect, perfect, yeah. So um, the first thing we thought that as we were going through that, let's do a quick revisit. Sometimes it's good to go back to the basics and answer the question is, what is a stakeholder? Uh, and if you could go to the next page. Um, yeah, th this is a, yeah, th this is, this, oh, sorry, go back one more, yeah. So sorry, yeah, this one, thank you. Uh, I, I think we all have different notions of what we meant if the word of stakeholder comes to mind. Uh, it would be interesting to kind of see, and it's also situational as well, right? And sometimes it's by precision, sometimes it's by the given circumstance, but oftentimes it's very much situational. And so we have to be very nimble. We have to be aware of it. And, and I think that, you know, Sergio, you and I both echoed in the fact that, you know, being able to be aware, first of all, who is a stakeholder and which is basically someone usually is one person or I mean an entity or sometimes could be a non, could be an entity, not an in, individual person uh, that has an interest or concern about something that something is what makes it situational. And uh, in our conversation and through Rashmi and team is that we wanted to first and foremost, of course, address the business perspective. But I hope that we also recognize is that business is only one lens of where we live. We live a personal life, we live a business life, we live, we, we live as an individual of the earth, of the world for that matter. So there is also that angle that, uh, that I think would be important. And, um, Managing stakeholder is probably one of the skills in my in my many many years in in the business world uh, as well as at home and outside of home. Um, I think is the one key of being successful or being happy versus not. Um, you, you you your thought, Sarika, on this as well. I personally believe that even the word success is so personal to everyone. And what does success look like? And depending on how you are able to define it to for oneself. So for me, um, almost a decade ago, the success of a typical corporate career or moving up the ladder in that or working for a particular pay scale had stopped making any meaning for me. So once we have defined that what that success means to you, uh, your definition of stakeholders, the way you engage with them also changes quite a bit. Uh, and that also I would like the audience to think through in terms of what success means to you as well. Yeah, that's a great point. And, and on that point, uh, Rashmi, can we do the first poll, if you don't mind? Yeah, that would be interesting to see uh, what people come up with an answer. Yeah. Yeah. So, so we have these uh, questions uh, in our mind, and uh, we would like you to kind of give us a sense of you know, who in your mind is your number one stakeholder? Okay, I've launched the poll. Thank you. And let's give folks a couple minutes. A minute. Rashmi, we can't see the poll. Uh, I, I saw it. I can see it now. Okay. So, uh, yeah, just in case, of course, right, who is your number one stakeholder? Uh, your manager, your organization, your, your shareholders or your owners? your family, your friends, or your communities, your clients, your customers, your vendors, your partners, and your support, or maybe even yourself. Um, so others are saying that they can't see the poll either. Uh, but I have about 18 people already. Per Perfect, okay, so, so okay. okay. Yeah, I, I see it. People have Thank already you. voted, yeah. Okay. So we'll give another 30 seconds and then I'll end the poll. Great. 
Yeah, th this is some part of the of our own debate as well, too, right? Man, it's hard to rank who is number one here. <laughs> Okay, so we have about 60% of the people who have voted, 64% in fact. Um, in the interest of time, should I close the poll? Um, yeah. Okay. And, and what, does, what does the poll say? Yeah, I'm ending the polling and I will put the results, share results. Yeah. So can you see mm -hmm. the results? Yes. So 33% of you says that is your manager, your organization, shareholders, or owners. 17% of us says is the family, friends, and community. 21% of us talk about clients, customers, vendors, and suppliers. And 29% of us says is ourself. Um, this is quite a, a very telling uh, perspective, isn't it, Suika? I, I, I mean, I kind of expected it because I think as people and specifically coming from the Asian culture, we always tend to put ourselves right at the back. So yes, yeah. uh, it's, it's not surprising, but sometimes it is disheartening. Yeah, and, and uh, if I'm, I'm not going to chime in on that too, because uh, I, was, I was actually expecting on the question where it says your own self to be a lot lower than 29%. So one in four of us know and believe that yourself is also a stakeholder. This is awesome. Uh, but, but to be expected, just like Sarika, you were saying, right? The manager, the organization, our bosses and bosses and bosses, if you will, uh, still is the number one uh, stakeholder percentage. Right. So th thanks, everyone, for, uh, for helping us with this. And uh, so let's, uh, if you don't mind, Rashmi, uh, we, we um, was... We were also doing our own exercise and putting it in here on the next page. There you go. Okay. Um, so we we were also going through is that you know, and it's great to know to see others. Uh, I I had the luxury to have spent a lot of time in India, and I have a lot of my friends who is of uh, Indian uh, heritage. And I do know that, you know, beyond the normal suspects, the in-laws are also a very, very important, uh, and, and I share that culture as well from a Chinese perspective. And I do know, and it was, uh, it was an educational element to me when I first started spending a lot of time in India, that our in-laws and your in-laws really do have a lot of uh, say in, you know, in, in what we do. So that's a big part of the stakeholders. And if you could build the animation, uh, that's the next click. And this is what uh, we were wondering if there was enough. So I'm really thrilled to see that 29% of us also thought about ourselves. And uh, I, I think that the reality is true in that all of these are our stakeholders. And the question that we're asking is not exactly fair because I believe and um, love to get some of your guys' thoughts is that I believe our number one stakeholders changes depending on time and depending on situation. I and think, so, yeah. I couldn't agree more with you, Zarina, because when you spoke about whether it's our children, whether it's in-laws, at every stage of your life, when you're a young parent or when you're newly wed or later on when you're moving up in your career and, uh, you know, every time the stakeholders depend you know, your number one stakeholder is always you. You need to do what needs to be done. And then accordingly, the stakeholders change. Because I remember when I was a young mother, for me, my son's and his well-being was the first one. And depending on that, my in-laws became again a very big stakeholder because I needed their support to continue the career as well as continue uh, supporting my uh, son. Um, the same case of the stakeholder of the bosses, like depending on which career path you are in and where you're moving towards, um, that also changes. Uh, so I personally believe that the way you change, the other stakeholders change as well. Yeah, that, that's, I, 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 I totally agree as well too. I almost, as you were saying this, Rika, I also imagine this wheel that we're all looking at. If you stand it on a stand, and it spins and it changes. And it's in fact the reality of what the world is about, right? And, and, 
And oftentimes, I think it's not just one piece. We were unfair in setting up as a who's your number one stakeholder, but then there is number two, three, four, five, six, and seven, and to the number of n, and and all of that has to be managed and have to be addressed. And if I could use the word catered, and I think that's where it really becomes complex, because we we don't we cannot make time stand still and say okay in this splice moment of time. I'm only going to worry about this pie, and then in the next moment of time, I get if we can able if we're able to do that, the world would be a lot easier. But but that's not really the reality. And uh, and I think if you don't mind, go to the next page and where we are right now. Oh gosh! All of a sudden, does like multiply right with talking about this pie standing on a stand, and then if it spins, and all of a sudden it used to maybe rotate. I don't know, maybe a minute at a time, and all of a sudden it's rotating every single second. Um, I, I'd love to hear from you, Srika, as well, too, yes, in terms of how, how has it affected you? In fact, uh, my first three months, I, I joined this uh, startup, Laksha University. It's a fantastic uh, initiative. And uh, the first three months, I was completely on the road, and that's how it looked like the whole year would look like, and I was getting really physically tired. The first, when the lockdown happened, I said, great, I'm at home. I can work from home. I don't need to travel. Then suddenly, and I said, yeah, it's a, it's a nice time. It's a downtime. But I kind of realized that downtime, there's nothing known as downtime during this lockdown. The speed at which everything is changing is at a supersonic speed. Your stakeholders itself have changed. The way they communicate has changed. You cannot hire anyone because there are no resources. Your work is more than five times what you're expected to deliver. And these are expectations which is weighing on your shoulders day in, day out. And plus the anxiety um, of your team, of your stakeholders, of your project, the well-being. And yes, um, it was all supposed to be done yesterday, but unfortunately, we're sitting in Tura and we don't even know what the future looks like. So I couldn't agree more. And whether it's in a startup, I mean, whoever I speak to, I see my husband. I mean, he's in a large MNC company. And uh, even there is the same thing. So whether it's a startup, whether it's nonprofit, nonprofit people are going crazy because we are right at the grassroots level. We are working where the most relief work is happening. Or whether it's at a corporate or whether it's an entrepreneurship. Everyone is facing this crunch. Nobody is changed. And I would say this is not a single black swan event which has happened in many, many years. Uh, because COVID has been one black swan event oil price going down and a global lockdown. There are three black swan events happening at the same time simultaneously. Never happened before. Yeah, yeah. And it's really interesting too, is that one, one of the things that, uh, and as Synity, we are a global uh, company. So we have members everywhere around the world. So the dimension of time change and the dimension of you know the world perspective is one. Uh, what I really want to, and in particular, shout out to all of you who are now all of us working from home, but at home, you're also sharing the space, the attention time, and the attention span with the rest of your family. Right? Yes. Your family could be, if you have kids, and we all, a number of us have, and we were talking about it right before we joined here, that we have, you know, some of us have young kids, and some of us, you know, unfortunately, in my case, they're, they're kind of grown, but in a sense, it's kind of bad, too, because they're not here. I can't even see them. Um, and, and I could really envision, and one of my team members, actually two of my team members, have really young ones at home. And we were talking about how do you manage, even your kids in this case, right? They're doing homeschooling, and they're now at home, so they're sharing the load of what the teachers possibly would be doing in the classroom, but now at home. And all of a sudden, your stakeholders, like 5x, 10x, and, and, and then, you know, so... So one of the things I, I take a lot of pride in is that when I do meetings, if their kids needs to come in, I just say hi to them and I want to make them feel comfortable and because we're all in this together. In fact, you know, I'm glad, Zarina, you picked it up. I'm a mother of a teenager and, you know, a teenage son can be a pretty handy kind of a thing. And that person is now uh, at a lockdown, doing homeschooling. Uh, we really don't know what's happening online because most of the teachers will really know that they're actually handling a lot of brats, mm -hmm. specifically teenagers and high school students. Imagine working and having calls and the middle of it, you need to keep going and checking what's happening up there on the online. Are they actually doing things? I mean, God bless at least some of the kids, including mine, 
do what they need to do. But it's 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 a it's a what I'm saying. It also takes your mind space and your bandwidth. So with the younger kids, it's physically very tiring. But with a slightly older kids, if they are at home, it's mentally very fatiguing. Because when you are at work, at least it's out of sight, out of mind. But when you are at home, that's also you know playing on your mind. And then doubled with all the chores of home. Uh, one of the things I would also like to point out, Zarina, is that India being a situation where we have always had domestic help. Um, yeah. Unfortunately, a lot of the burden of domestic chores were ultimately being shared by the women. And I'm talking about both the mental load as well as the physical load. And uh, with the domestic help not being available during this lockdown, and, and trust me, many of them had wished that the domestic help was more available than their spouses or even their kids at home. Um, it has been a very double whammy because the, the household discipline or the uh, gadgets and the appliances at home are not geared up to do self chores. So that has also become a challenge. So it's been very interesting to see a lot of men and a lot of partners, both men and women actually, posting a lot of pics of doing domestic chores with their kids. And I do believe that has also changed a lot of people's mindsets at work, as well as, um, you know, larger sphere. So I'm hoping that this will help, you know, support the initiative of saying that we need to share the load equally. So yeah, that's a very big, um, I would say, resource constraint, which we are working in. Well, so, so speaking about resource constraint, uh, if we can move to the next page. So what Srigan and I have done here is that as we're going through that, there's a lot of things moving all at the same time. So we just thought, you know, let's take a look at this as a visual perspective. And and if you have ever tried, I tried and I didn't do very good at it. I actually learned how to uh, do juggling. And, you know, when you do two, it's a lot easier. And then three is okay. And then four, say, forget it. And then the reality is that, you know, with COVID, with all the things, and because of all the multitudes of stakeholders we were talking about, all this is coming at us, and and as we talked about earlier, I think our conviction is that maintaining a balance at the right time would be the right thing to to aim for, right? So I think this is the part that uh, the reality is that it's really up to each of us because when when whether you are the in many cases, I think we are also the stakeholders ourselves, and uh, how do how do we help manage this mishmash of things that's happening. Uh, one of the things that we put in here is that putting things center, uh, putting things and centering ourselves and centering things around us is gonna be really important. But the question is, what do you center it on? Mm -hmm. And I, I think that there is one thing as we earlier saw on the definition of stakeholders is that they care about one thing and they care about a particular thing and if we could really get back to really asking the question is, what is the value that if you are a contributor, that is expected of you to be delivered to the shareholder or shareholders for that matter? You know, the, the expectation, what is the outcome that we're trying to do? And if I may, I'll use the example of uh, business, again, go back to our business world that you know as as the CMO of the company and as every member of my team our core in terms of driving outcome is for the business in terms of you know results pipelines presence progressions and the like and anchoring on what is the value that we deliver helps steer things and give much better clarity is my is my one conviction um i would just like to yeah, I would just like to add on to thing, and I'll just share one anecdote to make it more clear. You know, when we, uh, many a times, and I work in an environment where I have multiple stakeholders, where my founders group itself is close to 80 plus in the new venture I'm involved in. And as a fundraise hat, you are kind of managing more than 100 plus people, or in fact, many even beyond that as your direct stakeholders. So one of the challenge what happens, they work in different time zones, they are busy people, and they work at a different pace many a times, and to keep adjusting to their pace, it's, it's a big challenge. So somewhere down the line, you know, creating that boundaries around your outcomes and creating 
a little more expectation setting is very, very valuable at, that, at this point of time. Just one example I will share. Uh, because they're working in different time zones or because they're working in different kind of time slots, some people are working late hours, some people are early risers and so on and so forth. I used to be indented it with a lot of messages, emails, calls at what they thought was a good time but possibly not a good time for me or for my team. So somewhere down the line, we had to kind of, you know, I, I started realizing that if I'm getting a very late message in the night, I, many a times I started responding very early in the morning because I'm an early riser. And I kind of tried to build that message in a very subtle manner. And it's most of the times it's, they do not realize it. It's not because they want to do it. It's just that they don't realize it. In a very subtle manner, if you say, I'm not a late night person, I'm an early morning person, that message goes across. And uh, yeah. you can do it in very many, many smart ways to do this. So sometimes you build that boundary around you upon your outcomes and what needs to be delivered. Um, and if that's delivered in the right way, in the right manner and in a timely manner, I don't see uh, stakeholders also hold it against you. So these mm -hmm. are some of the things but, but communication of those outcomes and values is very important. And that needs to be shared as authentically as possible. Yeah, yeah, totally. And, and it just reminded me of something too, Zrika, is that, you know, if, and then think about this, if there is a, if the target is constantly changing and imagine the visual that you're seeing right now and this whole situation keeps spinning and spinning, it makes it really hard for anybody to anchor. And in order to have some level of balance, you have to anchor it on something. So one of the things that I found that, uh, through my years at IBM and at SAP and here at Sanity as well too, and, and somewhat at home is to have an agreement with your stakeholders in terms of what good looks like. Yeah. What, is the, what is the outcome we are all in agreement on? And what are the one thing or the two things that we all agree to be priority? And if, if we can really practice more and more of getting that upfront agreement, it would really, really make life a lot easier. At least you wouldn't have to spend the time to spin and say, are we pointing north or are we pointing south? If everybody is totally agreeing is to say, I want to go 18 degrees to the, to, to the south, you know, to, to, toward the south, uh, as opposed to going north, that precision will help greatly in terms of managing stakeholders. Uh, in this case, I also find that was helpful managing myself. And in this case, is both myself as a contributor, as well as myself as a stakeholder. That if I know what is the outcome, and you can decide the time horizon for that, if the outcome and in the explicit, you know, uh, that we're driving for is three months is A, six months is B, and three years is C then you know at what point can you pivot and do you pivot toward those A, B, and C? Yes, and, and that's why the communication with your stakeholders, a continuous communication with the stakeholders, both in terms of deciding on those outcomes as well as the progress you made towards the outcomes becomes very, very important. And I think during these times, uh, a bit of an over-communication cannot be negated, uh, both whether it's on the upward side or whether it's towards your team side. I think that kind of communication is required on both the sides. Yeah, and, and if I may, before we go to the next piece is to ankle back what you said, Sarika, as well too, right? which comes back to, and 29% of us says that your stakeholder number one is yourself. And I think that spending time and looking at what is important to you and to each of us as our own stakeholder would be very important. And what, what therefore is acceptable and what is not acceptable, what would be a good stretch that you're willing to take the risk for and what would be completely out of the question, I think is something that we need to anchor within ourselves, right? right. What's the most important and, and therefore understanding and holding ourselves true to ourselves is going to be important as well too. Because uh, I, I, I know sometimes, you know, say, well, it's nice to do, let me go ahead and do that. And if you do something that is really against what you, what is true, really true, not to yourself, and that, that pivots you away from your anchor, I think. Yes, so true, so true. Yeah. 
All right. Uh, so, Rashmi, in this case, I wonder if it would be a good time. Let's take. A, let's do our next poll with um, with the audience, with everyone here. Uh, we are facing COVID, and the well has been like we just talked about: upwards, sideways, left. There's no more, no, no more axes around. Uh, we'd love to know how how is it uh, working for you. Yeah, I have launched the poll. Can you see it? Uh, yes, I can. And just in case, again, the poll is that what worked well working from home during these times when you, uh, while managing your, your stakeholders? The choices, of course, are time and space to do new creative things, more accountability for work, freedom to manage work as per our schedule, managing a virtual team, increased delegation, and, and feel free to uh, let us know what your thoughts are. So while, while we're going through that, uh, I, I do want to share that here at Synity, we started uh, applying work from home uh, across the world and in all of our offices the, the 7th of March, actually. So it's been two and a half months, amazing to think that it's already and that. And I think we've all learned uh, quite a bit in terms of the new mode of operation. So uh, when we come back to the poll, we can talk more about that. So, uh, Zarina, you want to do this uh, the next poll also? Are you? Are you uh, no, 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 no. I'm, I'm saying no, uh, no. Uh, let's see what the poll, what the results are giving us. Okay. And then uh, we'll we'll give another twenty seconds. We have about sixty-two percent people who've taken it. They're still okay. taking it. All right. And and thank you, everyone who's online or or watching and participating in this as well. I think freedom is the one which is going in a very upward trend right now. <laughs> ah, all right. Okay, I'll, I'll give another five, seven seconds and then I'll end the poll. Uh, okay, I'm ending the polling right now. Okay. Sharing the results. Wow. Yeah, so I guess we can all see that. Uh, like you said, R Rashmi, the first one was freedom to manage work as per my schedule was 83%. That's a really awesome uh, ups, uh, you know, uh, uh, indication in terms of how, how things are working. Uh, the next one that has the highest is actually number one. It's the first one, which is 50% of us talk about time and space to do new creative things. And then right after that is 46% uh, of us talk about uh, 40 uh, managing a virtual team. And then uh, we have subsequent to that is more accountability for work. And uh, last of it is increased uh, delegation. And, you know, these are, you know, thank you for all of you who chose multiple because I think this is, this is definitely a multiple uh, situation. Uh I suddenly the polls, uh, I mean, uh, are you able to see the poll right now? I am yeah. not able. Yes, yes, we can see the poll. Oh, can yeah, see I can see it, yeah. So um, I, I, it's interesting, uh, and I love, Surika, maybe from your viewpoint, uh, looking, most of the folks here are from India. Uh, I think this freedom to manage work as per my schedule is a, is a, well, is a well welcome uh, phenomenon, is it? So in fact, uh, you know, uh, Serena, I know working from home was over the years trending and moving towards it. But even then in India, the, the culture being such that, that if you're out of sight, you're out of mind, your managers want you to be in the office, they want to see what you've been doing. And while some organizations, specifically IT industry, had started the trend for work from home, but it was not there happening in the other industry. I am suddenly seeing, and whenever I'm speaking to many other stakeholders, many other business leaders, I'm kind of realizing and I'm hearing this. They're saying, you know what, this is working quite well. I didn't realize that work from home could work well. And all of these were the skeptics earlier. You know what, work from home is okay for once or twice, but that really doesn't work. You need to be in the office, you need to have that. So there is certain pros and cons of work from office and certain pros and cons of work from home, but there's no to say that it doesn't work at all. So I do see a lot of changes and I think it's a welcome change both for the managers as well as for the employees. It cuts down on the commute time. 
There's more yeah. food time for everyone. People are eating more healthy. They are less tired. Therefore, they can bring in a lot more productivity. But yes, it does bring down a bit of the team element, I would say, the whole team effectiveness element, which a lot of managers are now struggling with and they're trying to put it together. But I'm not surprised that everybody is rejoicing the fact of saying, I can manage as per my schedule. I can decide what time I want to start or what time I want to end. Uh, though I do believe that people are now working much longer hours compared to earlier, but still that freedom and flexibility is there. So I, I welcome this change quite a bit. Yeah, yeah, I, I echo the same with you as well too. So, um, so when I was when we were working from the office, just take my personal uh, arrangement. So when I'm in the office, it takes me. I'm, I'm very fortunate uh, compared to a lot of the traffic that I am very cognizant of and aware of in India. Uh, it takes me usually about 25 minutes to come to the office, and then it takes me sometimes 45 minutes to go home if I'm, you know, going to the office. About and just saving those time and the hassle and then you know uh, and we'll talk in a minute here uh, in terms of how how to make the most out of the work and from home environment that was really a welcome change to me that i didn't expect i mean that i wasn't it was so much for granted that you have to travel to go to the office and that you had to arrange for time and so on and so forth I'm, I'm saying just look at the number of events the virtual events which have gone up people have raised funds on virtual events I mean, I used to travel crazy. I was doing India, San Francisco. I, in last three months, in from Jan to Feb, I did some three times. And yeah. it was such a waste and such a big carbon footprint, I would say. And now we are hosting these Zoom webinars with our stakeholders. And they say, yeah, it works pretty well. And, and I'm kind of realizing that possibly it can work post COVID as well. And it, it saves so much more time. Uh, yeah. So there's a, I do personally believe that there's so, always some opportunities, some silver linings to a disruption. So one of the things is that people have e explored and adapted the virtual team meetings, the virtual meetings, as well as the virtual team, um, work from home. I think that adaptation will be something which will be very, very welcome. Yeah, and, and I hope that more and more businesses will be more tuned to that as well, too, and seeing the best of it as opposed to the negative side of it. 64% of the CEOs recently surveyed said their productivity of the team has gone up since the lockdown. Of course, the business is down, but the productivity is still going up. So that says a lot as well. Yeah, Possibly yeah. This is what we needed. Yeah. <laughs> well, let's start. But tell both of you that we've uh, just got about 15 minutes. So uh, yeah. let me know how you all want to go forward. Okay. Yeah. If you can go ahead and move forward to uh, some of our collective observations in, in terms of work from home, uh, that would be helpful. That would be great. Okay. So the next page. The next poll? Yeah. No, no, no. The next page. We should be... Yeah, and then there you go. Okay, so so these are just some of the things that we we were brainstorming, right? Sarika and I were going through this is to say is that what are some of the things that we could count on a little bit more? Uh, I think it's pretty self-explanatory. So in the interest of time, we may not go into all of that, but I do want to highlight two. Uh, one is that, and, and I, I'm very cognizant of that in the sense that when you are so used to, and all of us here, I think, are very used to being in front of other people and being, whether it's because of the commute or because when you go to the office, there are teammates. And in, in India in particular, I love the, I love the buzz that, you know, you watch in the street and that's always been my favorite time when I'm in commute and I'm watching everything's going on. And all of a sudden, all those stimulus, the positive side of it are gone. And, and I think that that's really important to make sure that we take as ourselves now, whether it is ourselves as a stakeholder or other members of the family who are now with us inside the work from home or school from home, uh, the mental being, the wellness uh, about, and, and the physical wellness uh, is, is something that I just wanted to kind of underscore, you know, if it is the mind, if it is the body, because your your norm, well, our normal routine is no longer the routine. No, I 
I, you know, some of the routines is good on this, but one of the things which has worked well for me also is that it gave me time to pick up my own interests and hobbies. So while a uh, lot of people have focused on meditation, my my partner, my husband focuses on meditation. I focus on painting. I picked up my interest of painting. I noticed and, that. That's yeah, beautiful. Uh, so my painting and reading, I started, and that's very meditative. So these are some of the things which worked for me. And um, I do believe that having mentors and sponsors around you, which are act like a personal advisory board. I know, Zarina, I have you on my side. And that's been a blessing. Um, reaching out to them during this crisis when you feel that there are some questions is a great way to bounce off some of those anxiety, concerns, or any kind of issues which you're dealing with right now. So building up those kind of stakeholders, which is just beyond your work and beyond your yes. family, is also very, very important. I would, I would like to add on to this. Yeah, t totally. And, and that network, and that right? And then uh, if you could go forward to the next page, I think this is what, uh, you know, we always talk about managing stakeholders as if you have to manage them. And uh, I think what we wanted to say is here is that there are, no, go ahead, uh, yeah. Uh, there, there, there are the reality in terms of stakeholders by right and by definition sometimes could be your best friend. It could be your best ally. It could, they could be your best of everything. And uh, these are just some thoughts in terms of, uh, you know, uh, as, a, as we were thinking about it, is that, you know, this is the first part. And I really learned this uh, over the years, as well as one of my, my dear customers here. Uh, one of my, uh, and, and he always talked about, start with the end in mind. If you remember the picture where we had a lot of juggling balls and you know going up and down and all that and anchoring on what is it that we're trying to achieve, which is this end in mind, will always help regardless of whether you are a stakeholder or a contributor. I'm gonna make an argument that all of us, if, if at any point of time that if you don't think that you are a stakeholder, I would ask you to think again, because at the end of the day, whether you like it or not, you are a stakeholder, managed and as well as, you know, uh, touched by other people. Sometimes we forgot about that. Sometimes we didn't know that at the same time we're contributing, we're also being a stakeholder. Um, you know, and then understanding and finding that common ground, which is the whole anchoring element, you know, is, is part of negotiation, really, frankly. And I think, Sarika, you mentioned about the over-communications. And a big part of the over-communicating, I totally agree with us as well, is, is being able to be actively listening uh, and, and being on the end of appreciating where they're coming from is, is a big part as well, too. Yeah. Do you want to talk a little bit about the, the empathy piece? Yes, I, I do believe that putting yourself into the shoes of your um, both your managers as well as your employees. Remember this, that even the managers whom you're reporting into, they also have their own sets of pressures of business, timelines, numbers, everything put together, as well as with your team of working from home and everything. A bit of an understanding on both the sides does help you to bridge that gap between the two of them quite a bit. Um, and I did see a question on the chat box. I would not say a question, a comment from Manish, Manisha out here. She said that while it was understandable my managers that all household chores and kids have to be managed, but she's not sure that when it's BAU, and I'm assuming that it's a business unit, then would managers be so considerate about employees managing their own schedule? Well, Manisha, I do understand that everybody has to work on a certain time zones and time frames. But a bit of an empathy during this period of time that those time frames and time zones might change a little bit goes a long way. You will have to be taking care of your smaller kids and they have their own schedules and routines. And therefore knowing each and every individual in your team and what their challenges or individual challenges be has become more imperative today. So empathy is a very, very big, and, that, and you can manage your team scheduling accordingly and make sure that everyone has their own personal space or maybe three or four hours it's such a space where everybody can work together so there are ways of managing it but only empathy can bring that together yeah i i think what i also read on that on the comment too is that in a sense the pandemic had thrown people to realize 
and accommodate or, or allow things to be a little bit more accommodating, such as, you know, doing the household chores and I need to go do this right now. I have to go, you know, take, take care of the kids or whatever. But in a business as, as usual basis, in the non, in the post COVID days, when things come somewhat go back to the normal, if there is such a thing of normal, then maybe they would not be as understandable. That's what I also heard the, the question as well too. And I, I couldn't agree with, with Manish uh, more on the observation that I think this is really one of the things that I, as much as we hate what is happening to us all, it really is bringing the human side of us a lot more. And, and I'm really hopeful, and this is a bit of an optimistic and hopeful thinking that we, we both as managers and contributors and stakeholders are going to be more and more cognizant of those types of demand that we wouldn't have had been preview to before. I think it also goes back to the last point in here is that more and more of us and more often, we need to learn to say no. There are times and plays for when things just would not be accommodated, what cannot be possible, or just just sometimes it's the wise thing to say is no or find an alternate way of saying not just yes, if you will. Yeah. So true. So true. hopefully we yeah, we, we, I think we can the biggest skill we can have is learn to say no and do it in a way where you are while you're being assertive, but you're also not letting the other person down. Sometimes that you're doing a service to the other person by saying no, because you're not putting yeah. any expectations out there. Yeah. And and one last point that I want to make before we go to the next page here is that I think as stakeholders, and I've been I've been fortunate enough to have been a stakeholder whereby a lot of folks come and help and, and deliver to what we're looking for. I also believe that we could be a better and a more effective stakeholder as well. Uh, you know, it takes two to dance that, you know, contributors could be maybe find smarter way of getting things done in less time or less effort if there is such a thing. The stakeholders needs to also be more understanding. Maybe that's part of the conversation as well that was just talked about. Yeah. Anyway, so, so um, I have yeah. a question for both of you. So in the question of, uh, you know, in the statement of saying learn to say no. Now in this COVID time when everything is very virtual and you are hearing about job losses, you're hearing about, um, you know, everybody wants to show their value. So, um, so there is also this back fear back in the mind saying that, you know, let me just do everything what is being told because I need this job. I need to pay my EMIs. Uh, so how do you say no there? I mean, you know, you, there, there is this entire pressure to, you know, sort of, uh, because the circumstances are that. So how do you yeah. do, manage those things? I'll, I'll, I'll make a first step, step at it. I, I think this goes back to our earlier point, which is to find center. To understand, I mean, at least within your own personal parameter, what is acceptable? I'm going to make this just very blunt. So if it is, a, as, as an example, if your family if you have all your family, your, your parents or your in-laws and your children all there with you, and that 20 minutes or the 30 minutes of having the time with them for dinner is, as an example, if you agree to be unnegotiable, that is the time that you're going to have. I would say as a stakeholder, most of us would totally understand because we are all at the end of the day human as well. I think it takes us to say that, you know what, I, I will get to it, but if you would just make sure that I want to make sure that I spend my time and my dinner time and my family time for the next 30 minutes, I'll come back to it. And it's, that's just a way of coaching and honestly shaping and, and educating the stakeholders too, to be better stakeholders. You know, sometimes you don't say it. Rashmi, I'm glad you put this point across. It's not about just saying no, but it's also putting about the boundaries out there. Um, so the idea again over here is that, I'll just give one classic example. Um, when I'm writing my emails, which is late night or which is early morning, which works for me or my personal time, I put this line in my, as a signature saying, I'm sending this email, which supports and suits my flexibility of time. Please take your time and action on it, reply on it, which works for you. So just putting these two lines in my signature is saying a lot, not only to my team, but also to my stakeholders that I value your time. So please value mine. 
And in a very subtle manner, in every email, over a period of time, I did this for four or five months, over a period of time, it starts registering. And it's a good practice to have for many senior stakeholders also, because yeah. then you are, in today's world, when we're living in a virtual world, when everybody is working in different kind of time zones, uh, it's when you read that, you understand that the person has put it at their own time, it's okay for me to put it or reply to it or action to it in my own time. You have to be a little, uh, what you call, subtle and smart about it. Uh, nobody is saying an emphatic no, but you have to be smart about it. Or you can ask, it's great you want me for, to do this. Um, just to let you know, I'm working on this, this, this. I have a team member, Nikita, who does it fantastically. I possibly pull her into so many things because she's fantastic. She delivers so well. I want her in every project. So I will, every morning, I'll say, hey, Nikita, you know what? I have two more ideas. Can we do this for our marketing? Can we do that? She does it so well. And she's a young girl. And possibly I can take pride in the fact that we coached her. She just says, fantastic. I think it's a great idea. You know what? I'm working on X, Y, Z right now. Is it okay if I focus on this for today, this for tomorrow? I should take this much time or help me to prioritize which one should I do well? So instead of saying no, you're letting your stakeholder know that you're plate is already full or your plate has certain urgent requirements and you can possibly prepone or procrastinate the other ones. So sometimes it's also important to do it in a smart manner is what yeah. I'm saying. Yeah, I told, totally. And, and the smart thing would also sometimes leverage. Uh, the, the, exactly. the, plan, the, theme of the, the approach of leveraging is a very important part. It doesn't mean to say we're the only one who could do it. And then if you can, yeah, that's, that's awesome. Yeah. So I'm just uh, a constant of time. Uh, yeah. Let's go ahead and wrap up, if, if we may, uh, yeah. to, to the next page. Um, this is just a, a, quick, a quick view in terms of, you know, yeah. Um, there, there are going to be times where we have to just set to ourselves what good looks like and what bad looks like. And if you recognize that it's a situation when it's really, really bad, so we decided not to fill in the blanks in all cases and kind of leave it up to you. But one that we decided to go ahead and do is that a really bad situation is when someone begins to be a bully. And I, I think that by right, not, none of the stakeholders should be bullying others in order to get things done. And bully has no respect and has no room, certainly in the business uh, environment. And I think certainly not at home, not at school either. And I, I just wanted to kind of bring that out. And as we were going through that is to say, let's, let's be cognizant of that. And none of us should subject ourselves to it. And, but that goes into the point is that if they're in the position of power, how do we, how do we manage them or somewhat train them to be either less bullying or make the point clear that bullying is not acceptable. And, and that's gonna bring some of the really hard questions, uh, hard conversations. In fact, uh, you know, Zarina, I would just like to add one thing just to for my audience. Bullying ne never necessarily means people who swear bad words or use harsh language or raise their tone and other stuff. It just does not necessarily mean that. Bullying could be possibly people who are undermining you, people who are criticizing you a lot, uh, who are not holding you responsible enough to give you certain projects over a period of time again and again and again. Even that over a period of time, time takes a lot of emotional uh, toil. Yeah. And there are ways to deal with it. Of course, the last way is always to quit and say that you can't, you mean most of the people don't quit organizations, but quit bad bosses. Um, but I'm just kind of putting it out there for people that we need to be cognizant of the fact that we are working in very, diff you know, very, very different and difficult times. And uh, we need to be also taking care of our mental health. And if someone is putting you into through that stress, or if a stakeholder does this, uh, it's important enough to educate and get some sponsor to speak up for you. So there are a lot of ways to deal with it, but there's definitely not a way to accept it. Yeah, yeah, and, and it's awesome as well too, is that when we talked about earlier, there are multiple stakeholders. Sometimes just leveraging the other stakeholders to either minimize 
or to kind of reduce the impact or the pain associated with that one bullying uh, stakeholder could be one way of solving that as well too. And then on the sure. positive light, there are, and I, I've had been really blessed with this situation that a, not, a lots of times the really good and understanding stakeholders whom you actually have over time earned the respect of, they become the best sponsors for us. And so it's kind of the yin yang to say, okay, is it always bad? Is it always good? No, it's, it's, it's the balancing of it again. And, uh, and I think if we do this right, and if stakeholders learn how to be best stakeholders, they could be the most wonderful ally that you could have. All right. Okay. So I think with that, we should just wrap up. And uh, um, this is just some of the takeaways. And I'm sure that each of you and the audience have your own takeaway. Um, this is just some that we have thought about. Uh, should any of these situations happen, I, I've learned over the years is that don't take things personal. Because the moment we begin, we begin to be personally emotional, that takes away the wit, that takes away the, uh, a better judgment, if you will. And that take every moment as a learning moment because we can always get better, we can always learn. And you know, we just talked about you know, say no when you know it's not the right thing to do or when it's the right thing for you to do is to say no, then you know, trust your instinct and follow, follow your instinct. And I am always of a believer, if you don't ask, you will never receive, it, it, it just, you know, you just have to ask. Yeah. Like uh, so we can to, ask to, to be our mentor and to be our sponsor. <laughs> yeah. So really, thank thank you, uh, Srika and Rashmi and everyone on the so call. The quick uh, is, uh, Zarina, just be there. I just just take a quick rapid fire round for both of you around your stakeholder management. I think the audience would like to know more uh, about how you sort of uh, react to stakeholders. So it's a very quick question. I want you all to answer in one line or choose, you know, this or that. Um, and uh, I, I think then we'll all be more clearer as well as to how do you all respond to situations. Okay, so my first question is, how would you rate your own stakeholder management during this COVID times? And you could give me a percentage number, just percentage. Um, so I'll, I'll start. I'm going to say that I'm, uh, in a scale of one to 10, I'm probably like maybe eight. Uh, I, I think I, I, I don't take good care of myself enough that uh, I haven't, you know, preaching on preaches that I need to take care, better care of myself as a stakeholder. Sure. Uh, I think that, yeah, I think speed is, is both a, an additive as well as a devil sometimes. So just balancing that. Tarika, what about you? Uh, I'll give myself seven because it was a new uh, environment in a new place, still learning on this. And I still see a lot of room for improvement, both for myself as well as the engagement with my, all my stakeholders. Um, but uh, one of the things I would definitely like to say is that uh, none of the stakeholders are completely black and white. Um, none of them are, uh, you know, I, I'm just saying that as what Zarina said, we just need to kind of consider them as humans and just move ahead. Uh, they, are, they are not what your destiny or they are not your destination uh, holders. So just move ahead with that. Okay, so uh, one, one last question before we close. Stakeholders in your view can be managed better in person or um, um, virtually? My, my answer to that I think is indifferent. Okay. Stakeholder management is about the interaction, and interaction is a combination of both face-to-face -face versus virtual, or combination therein. Yes. I don't think. Uh, I I would say it depends on two factors. Um, there are certain stakeholders who do not prefer a virtual, uh, who do not prefer virtual. They are more meetings person, and and I'm seeing some of the older stakeholders in terms of generation and age, um, and sometimes that makes it difficult. Uh, because that's their preference and that's the way they have always dealt with. Uh, but in other cases, I also feel that when you have, right now we are all in a level footing because every one of us are moving virtual. All mm -hmm. of us are in the virtual mode. So there's no other option. But suppose if there is an option of virtual and real, I would say do a good mix of both. Uh, you will not be able to get meetings, but you cannot just keep waiting for the meetings and not have any communication in between. 
so you need to work on both so i for this period of time it's indifferent but in other normal circumstances and i hope we do come back to normal circumstances it will be a mix of both sure yeah. sure okay so one last word from both of you to uh, you know on surviving and thriving while managing stakeholders so one word uh, that you can give to the audience before we close communication sarina i would say self pretend that you're going on the airplane they always ask you to put the air mask on the other person yeah. next to you first i mean on yourself first before you do the others yeah okay okay so thank you so much uh, zarina and sarika i know we are a little above time but uh, very very interesting uh, thoughts and thank you so much for putting this together both of you um so uh, thank you audience for being with us um we will be coming back for our inspiring thursdays uh, webinar next week where we actually uh, next week we are actually uh, coming with a master class on you know sort of career resilience and uh, we will want to uh, you know sort of see a lot more participation and i am just seeing if there is any question from the audience i can see some maybe you want to speak about the ili program uh, rashmi yes so uh, we sorry, will I'm, wearing, I'm i'm sorry i'm wearing a business hat on i always tend to remind about business <laughs> yeah so now we will be formally launching the ili program uh, uh, post the next webinar where uh, we will be talking about career resilience and we We, but unfortunately that that entire mentoring uh, i leap program is for women so here we today we have both men and women uh, uh, uh we will be coming up uh, we are have been known for our mentoring program over the last 7 8 years we've got a lot of accolades and lots of rewards for it people have found it very very useful but in covid times we have now made it a totally virtual program where we are uh, getting the similar kind of an experience but you know adding a lot more value and doing it virtually uh so we will be formally launching it uh, by next week we will be looking for nominations from everybody from organizations from individuals um in the entire month of june and we will formally starting the program by mid of july so please hear from us please do follow our handles and um, we look forward to having you uh with us in this mentoring journey so thank just you very much what what is one parting thought sorry i'm a spokesperson for beyond diversity whether sorry. in or beyond diversity so um men please please do not uh, get disheartened there are programs for you guys also we have coaching we have panel of coaches you can take coaching sessions uh with our panel of coaches and they have done extremely well whether it's on personal branding whether it's on managing stakeholders or any other such issues which you manage so do write in to us um as we can also help you to become better stakeholders and be better managers thank you so much thank you so much and um, i look forward to uh, you know getting both of you together post covid i think maybe in 6 8 months i think we will then again come back and discuss how have we managed stakeholders and what have we learned from there thank you so yeah. much well, and and all of you at beyond diversity keep doing the awesome work that you guys are doing so thank you so much sarita you're there with us thank, thank, you, so so thank you very much guys everybody Bye -bye. Yes, good evening thank you so much serena for joining in it's always a pleasure to host any session with you thank you so thank, much thank you likewise thank you very much thank you thank you serena have a good day and for all of us thank you thank you bye bye thank you